All right, good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee this morning. We are going to continue hearing testimony on S305 and we're going to hear from Vermont Gas. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. For the record, Dylan Giambattista, I'm the Director of Public Affairs, with BGS, Vermont Gas. This is my colleague, Morgan. Hi, I'm Morgan Hood. I am the Manager of Innovative Products and Services for BGS. So we are excited to be here today uh, to talk about thermal energy networks and geothermal systems. This is something that over a period of years uh, we have worked on, we've thought a lot about, and we've actually made significant progress to try to sort out if there's a utility model that might be available to our communities. So stepping back for a moment, just to give you a high level, I'm going to talk a little bit about the amendment itself, uh, some of our approach to this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Morgan, who's really the expert in some of the work that's underway, so you can get a snapshot of what is possible. Uh, but in short, you know, BGS, we've been a utility for the past almost 60 years. We are the state's lone gas utility. We serve 55,000 premises in northwest Vermont, including Franklin County, Chittenden County, and Addison County. How many did you have? 55,000. So we are the lone gas utility and over a period of years, we've actually transformed into a service provider in the thermal space. So about uh, 30 years ago, in 1992, we began offering a suite of efficiency services. Those include a comprehensive weatherization for residential customers and also businesses, right up to our largest customers, uh, commercial and industrial. We provide equipment upgrades and rebates. So we have serviced uh, gas equipment over many years. And a series of years back, we actually started servicing electric appliances, things such as heat pump water heaters, centrally ducted heat pumps. We're getting really excited to launch a mini split ductless heat pump program this month. Uh, we also have done things such as a commercial scale solutions, such as electric boilers, something that we see as a real solution to decarbonize that will be effective for our customers. Uh, and we've looked at geothermal and thermal energy network technology as well. So we're gonna tell you all about that. Before we get into it, you have a bill here in the committee, S-305. We're speaking today on this particular amendment on thermal energy networks. Uh, at the outset, I'll say that we've had a collaborative process that contributed to the language that was brought to the committee. So the, the language that was unveiled last week on this amendment is something that we had an opportunity to weigh in on. We've worked with uh, some of the folks that we've heard from in the past week, uh, Jim Dumont and Debbie New, who were here. Uh, they've been all around the state talking to folks about these systems. And it's something that we've had an active interest in. Morgan will tell you all about that. With regard to the language in the amendment, we support the language that was brought to the committee. In it, uh, it would basically provide jurisdiction over these projects for the PUC. Uh, they would have both oversight of the Section 248 process of citing the actual project. And additionally, the jurisdiction would allow for rate setting, something that we think is possible and would be positive. Uh, and we, we certainly have an interest and have thought a lot about that. Um, we also heard the testimony brought by a representative of the Public Utility Commission, who suggested that perhaps in the near term, the better approach would be to set up a study process, where over the next year and a half or so, the commission would uh, investigate these systems and come back and propose a regulatory structure to the General Assembly in January of 2026. Uh, we do support that approach as well. Certainly, this uh, is an area that can be complicated, and we want uh, the regulatory process to come up with the best the best. Uh, design for these this regulatory scheme that would guide this. And so we are supportive of that proposal. Um, we're also supportive of the concept that perhaps in the meantime, there is an exemption for municipal projects. I know you heard testimony from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, from the Public Utility Commission, and from uh, Jim Dumont and Debbie New on that. Uh, we are comfortable with that. And perhaps if there's another exemption for affordable housing or something of that sort, it's a, an area that we're focused on with these systems, we could be supportive of that. One request that I do have of the committee, uh, we sent language to a couple members. Uh, we had a conversation with staff from the Public Utility Commission, the Department of Public Service, uh, Jim Dumont and Debbie New, to flag an issue that, that we had considered. And that was, if a study was going to be the approach over the next year and a half before it was brought to the General Assembly, um, what would it mean for our exploration of these systems? And what we want is uh, we would request an, an amendment or incorporation of language into that amendment that would allow uh, entities regulated under Title 30 utilities um, to explore these projects and continue the work that we're doing. Because what we see is tremendous demand in the field. Uh, in particular, we serve a couple of communities that have adopted ordinances um, that set performance standards. So things such as uh, you know, traditional fossil service 
uh, might not be as uh, preferable to a decarbonized solution. So we've been working on a number of systems. We think that geothermal and thermal energy networks are ways that we can serve things such as new development in those communities or affordable housing projects. And so we have submitted some a language request to members of the committee that would uh, simply state that for Title III entities, uh, nothing would preclude exploration of these types of systems while the study is taking place. And uh, we did share that language with the staff from the commission and staff from the Department of Public Service, and they had an opportunity to weigh in before we share. So that's where we stand on the proposal as it's evolved. What we really want to do today, though, is talk to you about what we've done in this space. I've submitted some testimony, and the, the second page of the testimony includes a list of all the recent activities that we've done in this space. But this work has unfolded over a period of years. I mean, we, we actually began working on decarbonized solutions before the adoption of the Global Warming Solutions Act in 2020. While we for years have served gas service primarily, that's our primary product, we recognize that there's an opportunity to serve customers in decarbonized ways. That's why we've begun serving heat pump water heaters, uh, heat pumps to customers, and that's why we're exploring things such as geothermal and thermal energy networks. There's also all sorts of potential benefits in the design of these systems, which Morgan is the expert on and can tell you about. But we're here because we're enthusiastic about the proposal. We think it could do a lot of good for Vermont. We think that it's an opportunity to scale these systems and serve customers with the warmth and cooling that they're going to need uh, as we move forward and, and meet our climate goals. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Morgan. And then, you know, as we're going, if you have any questions specifically about the proposed amendment um, or any of the design of these, we'd be happy to take them. So, okay. well, Actually, I have a question for you. You sure. said your amendment would allow you to continue to explore uh, explore and can't even read my own writing, but <laughs> explore and continue your work, meaning you would be able to create one of these systems before the before the sort of reporting and the standing of more yeah. clear guidelines. Sure. So uh, we're a fully regulated utility, mm -hmm. and we have uh, different types of regulatory uh, structures that we operate under. One is called an alternative regulation plan. Every several years, we are reviewed by regulators. We have a conversation about our goals. And we have a, a set of dollars within that uh, alternative regulation plan. We call them innovation funds is sort of the short title. They're described in my written testimony that I submitted. We have used those dollars to explore different technologies. I, I mentioned electric boilers. Uh, we've looked at different uh, decarbonized fuels, all sorts of things. Amongst those, we've done a lot of project scoping for geothermal energy systems and for thermal energy networks. In our most recent, uh, recently approved alternative regulation plan, there's an update in the language that describes how we can pursue these projects. So under existing regulatory authority, uh, we believe that we have the authority to do this. However, we welcome a full regulatory review and structure to be set up. So the language that we provided, um, we did add a clause suggested by staff from the Public Utility Commission that would make clear that this would be um, consistent with alternative regulation plans. So that would be essentially the, the piece that would moor it to existing policy. So the language that we proposed to do that, and we believe that it would allow us to um, continue to develop these projects. When I say develop, I mean doing the research and development, but also um, highlighting what might be possible with different structures uh, to pay for the projects, to have uh, customer involvement, and so on and so forth. And it might be uh, that because of the demand we're seeing from developers that we may bring forward projects to the Public Utility Commission under existing regulatory authority to seek approval. That's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that's good. I'm, I'm supportive. And I just, yeah. I, so I'm hearing you say that there's a possibility if there's, um, if you could pull it off that you might be able to get something constructed in the shorter term. We're, we're really optimistic about okay. it. And, but you, but not to open a, maybe a sore spot, but you tried once before, as, as far as I know, and um, we're not able to, what were the barriers there? Yeah, so um, the explanation with that, when we went forward, uh, we were working with Rutland Regional Medical Center. We proposed a project there, which was a geothermal project in an outpatient treatment center on campus. We put together a business plan, worked with a consultant. Um, we even uh, you know, brought our staff down to understand the technical pieces of this. That was under our, our previous alternative regulation plan. And during the regulatory process, 
uh, to seek approval for our new one, we had a discussion about this. At the time, the regulators uh, cited that the project was outside of our gas service territory. It was in Rutland County. We do not have a gas in infrastructure in that part of the state. And so that was one barrier. But since that time, um, our current alternative regulation plan, um, we think has, has accommodated uh, some of the flexibility around these types of projects. And we're feeling really comfortable with existing regulatory authority under our alternative regulation plan that we have some latitude to work on these projects. I will tell you that the primary um, customer base that we've been receiving inquiries from is within our gas uh, territory service footprint. Thank you. Representative Stebbins, then Pat. Thanks, Senator Chair. And if it's okay, I just wanted to give an update since our witness keeps referring to, we've shared some language with the member, um, if it's okay to do now. Um, basically, the amendment currently would require the PUC to start a full <clears throat> regulatory process to develop all of the regs for all types of thermal energy networks. Um, it would require the start of that regulatory process this October, 2024. And the amendment says the rules would be, the regs would have to be uh, finalized by July of 2025. Um, so we heard from the PUC, uh, we're pretty busy. Um, so the difference um, between what is in here right now in terms of um, designing the full regs, that would be a pathway that, you know, in future, uh, a utility might not have to go through, you know, a one project approach via the alternative um, regulatory ARP uh, plan. So uh, the amendment that's been, or the language that was shared with me that I did share with our ledge council um, yesterday, uh, but as you can imagine, our ledge council is very busy on 687 downstairs. The language that I shared with Ellen yesterday essentially says, it, it clarifies um, that because we're asking the PUC in a future language to do a study, um, that's another proposal from the PUC. The PUC said, Rather, we're happy to do a study. Um, what was recommended was just confirm and clarify that via the current approach, they could still do one project, perhaps via a project by project within their alternative regulatory plan, as compared to what's in here would be a full <laughs> regulatory process so that they so that there is a clear approach for every type of project that might be out there. So that's the difference. It's it's basically clarifying that what is currently in the ARP could be used while this study is occurring. Representative Pat. Uh, that kind of addresses uh, uh, some of some of my question, but I, I just want to understand in terms of your your current um, approved alternative regul uh, regulatory plan. What do you have? How much do you have authority to do under that? Obviously, you can do study stuff. Uh, you can do a pilot project, but it, it, can you implement uh, beyond that? Um, uh, to, you know, or or is some of the language changes proposed in the in the bill would allow that uh, without a, un, under the alternative regulation rather than having to be approved project by project? I guess. Yeah. Currently, uh, we believe that broad authority does exist to bring these projects forward. And we've just been working um, to look at the scope of a few. And uh, we do anticipate that that authority currently exists. Um, this process would clarify that during the term of the study, when the PUC is developing that regulatory structure, that uh, we can continue to pursue that. Thank you. Now, I really do want you to hear from the expert, though, because the things that we're doing in this space, I got to tell you, I was recently with some colleagues down in Albany, New York, at a gathering of some gas utility folks who are thinking about the state policies that are coming, decarbonization policy. And um, the things that we are doing here in Vermont um, are putting us in a real leadership role. And thermal energy networks is more to it. And we're excited at the progress we see in other states, but also there's some really exciting stuff going on. So Morgan's the expert. Morgan should take it. I think Dylan's just humoring me and wanted to give me an opportunity to nerd out on something I'm really passionate about. Um, but I'll try to keep it relatively brief, uh, give you a short story and then more conversation. That's the most interesting bit. 
Uh, Dylan alluded to some things that are for foundation setting. Uh, VGS a announced a climate action plan in 2019, and uh, that's to achieve net zero by 2050. That's what lured me over to the company from my background in energy efficiency and decarbonization for the entirety of my career. Uh, he talked about some of the products that we've started offering uh, since I came on, and those are products that are geared to help people with all sorts of thermal energy solutions, especially people who are looking to decarbonize. So we began with heat pump water feeders. We've extended to centrally ducted heat pumps. We're being very mindful about um, the education we provide to customers when installing centrally ducted heat pumps about how to optimize them to use them for heating. And as Dylan mentioned, we're rolling out ductless mini splits. Uh, with all of those offerings, and this extends over into geothermal, we are looking at how to make these technologies as affordable and accessible to all of our customers as possible and as easy. So uh, as part of our program design for all of these, we're vetting a wide array of potential products to offer. We only offer a couple. We evaluate them based on performance and efficiency, but we want to offer what's going to provide the lowest price, the highest quality. Um, we're very mindful of staying cost competitive with everybody else doing the work out there. Um, and uh, we lease and, and uh, are able to offer these technologies to customers with no big upfront investment. It's able to go directly onto their Vermont gas bill. And it's super handy because, hmm, excuse me, we have a full fleet of service technicians, about 30 individuals who are trained to work on natural gas equipment. And we've been transitioning a fair number of them over to work on electrification equipment. But these are the folks that are in your home when you experience a system failure. When your water heater fails, we, we're the ones who come into your home and we're able to recommend a heat pump water heater, for example, if it's appropriate to you, help you lease it, easy decision, cost comparable to the fossil fuel solution. So with the products that we're developing, we're really trying to present ourselves as a thermal energy solution provider there to help the customer uh, pursue a path to decarbonization and we're always, of course, being a gas utility, very mindful of the budgets that, that people are working with. We want to get them as far as we can, given their financial constraints. So all of that sort of led us to exploring community geothermal. The same goals, the same mission and passion there. Uh, and when we began looking at what a utility offering of community geothermal could look like, we realized we checked a lot of boxes. So again, we have these service technicians who are knowledgeable now on both natural gas and electric equipment. We're in the process of educating them on the ground source heat pump, the in-home equipment component of a community um, geothermal system. We have construction employees who are laying pipe and welding pipe. Uh, they're very familiar with delivering thermal energy through a piped infrastructure. Uh, and to that end, uh, this was about a year and a half ago, we brought in uh, trainers from the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association to provide our folks with an overview of what community geothermal would look like. And it was a really engaging conversation because they saw all the commonality there. So we're thinking about, we've got these phenomenal employees, many of them have been with us for a very long time. And it's not that we're looking to transition them entirely away from the skill sets that they've utilize serving a natural gas company. We're just working with them to broaden their array of skill sets so that they know what they need to know to address future um, market demands. So, and on the other side with community geothermal, we thought we're a gas utility. We, we invest in, in large infrastructure projects and we experience a payback over a period of many, many years. And it's very much a part of the fabric of who we are to deliver energy and have it be as accessible and affordable to as broad an array of people as possible. So that lent itself really well to community scale geothermal. Uh, we began our research uh, probably two and a half years ago now, and we fine tuned our approach. Right now, our thinking is primarily focused on the residential and mixed use new construction community. Uh, that within the counties that we serve. As you guys know, there's you know, a need for a lot of housing. We're seeing a lot of developments. So we initiated conversations with about a dozen developers uh, with whom we had ongoing relationships over the years because we delivered natural gas to their developments. 
And they're all receptive to the idea of community geothermal. They're looking for a business model, a financial model that makes sense to them and their residents. Uh, we've progressed with them over time. We've got about four projects right now where we're conducting high level feasibility studies. And uh, with one, we've even presented a proposed financial model that maps out the potential costs to the developer and their customers to engage with VGS on a community geothermal system. And they found that to be attractive. So that's the market we're targeting initially. A lot of these folks uh, would be looking to go all electric no matter what. So they're looking at uh, comparing a community geothermal system with VGS and uh, oftentimes an air source heat pump system for, for multifamily properties. So they're looking at long-term energy costs for their residents um, and owners. And they're also looking at you know, the infrastructure costs and the maintenance costs that are involved with each system. Yes, got a hand. Representative Smith. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, geothermal. And heat pumps are pretty pricey right at this stage. Uh, are you looking at, say, a typical 25, 2600 square foot two story home? Are you looking at uh, seven or 8,000 for a heat pump and 15 or 20 for a geothermal part of it? We were looking at, and I can go into this a little bit more, if we were looking at an independent system, one loop, per home, and your, those prices are accurate. Actually, I think they can get higher. Um, one of the reasons why a community scale geothermal system can be attractive is because we're proposing a community loop that serves all of the residents within a neighborhood or within a multifamily building or a pair of multifamily buildings. And there's some cost effectiveness that can be recognized there due to an array of factors. And also the, the model that we're proposing right now is there's the, the community loop, which the utility would own, much like we own the natural gas infrastructure right now. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to take full advantage of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act tax credits and, of course, pass those, those uh, tax credits along to the people paying into the system. In order to access those credits right now, the way the language is written, we have to own the loop and we have to own the in-home equipment. So what we are presenting, which is unconventional for a gas utility, uh, but VGS is uniquely suited to do that because we're already leasing and servicing uh, equipment. So what we're proposing with these folks right now is the, the resident, it can be folded into rent or it can be a, a monthly charge, pays an access fee for the loop, and then they lease the in-home equipment, one monthly bill, it's able to keep the costs controlled utilizing this utility model. And, uh, and through that, we're looking to make it as accessible and affordable to people because you're 100% right. An independent homeowner, for example, looking to install geothermal, even with the tax credits, okay. I've always thought of it as something that you have to be in a relatively mm -hmm. powerful financial position to. If you're looking for a loop, say, <laughs> would 20 homes be a safe yes. number? Can you do one drill for geothermal for 20 homes or do you need 20 drills? You, uh, it depends. Yeah. It very much depends. Uh, and this is also <clears throat> another reason why I like the idea of a utility model because there are upfront costs just to determine whether uh, geothermal is feasible in a given location for a given series of buildings. And uh, asking people to invest that cost when it might not play out in projects is an obstacle to geothermal, I think, for a lot of people. So our first step is to do some test drilling, going down in our area around 500 feet and looking at the, the ground conductivity and determining exactly how many holes we would need to drill at 500 feet to support the, ener the thermal energy needs of that community. So it could depend on what's it 500 feet down. It depends on what you find in the ground. And it also very much depends, and this is another reason why new construction is a nice, it's a nice clear path forward for, to start with. Um, Cause it also very much depends on the energy efficiency of the buildings being constructed. So when you're modeling a potential geothermal project for a community, you're looking at the ground conditions and determining how many boreholes need to be there to support the thermal needs of the buildings. And of course those thermal needs are gonna vary depending on how well the buildings are constructed. 
Um, most of the developers with whom we're working right now are building to um, the stretch code that Efficiency Vermont really promotes. So we've got a nice clear path for really high performing, more affordable systems uh, by working with this, this base, which isn't to say anything about um, one's ability to succeed retrofitting existing neighborhoods with geothermal. It's just a whole nother level of complexity there um, that didn't seem like the right place to start as we, as we get our feet wet. It was a little daunting. Um, I also wanted to share, so residential new construction and, and mixed use um, communities are what we're initially targeting. We've got developer buy-in and we're performing some initial feasibility studies. And we've already thought through what a business model and a financial model might look like uh, for these projects. And we're having conversations with developers about their receptivity to that. Uh, and what they're telling us informs our approach. So we're being very responsive to what the developers are saying. And um, we're engaging with other members of the community too. We uh, received a grant through the Department of Energy back in May of last year. And that grant was to explore <clears throat> our community geothermal system, ideally with a, a low income community. So to that end, we are using that money to pay for the initial feasibility study and the system design for uh, the Windy Bridge project in Heinsberg, which is a collaboration between Champlain Housing Trust, Evernorth, um, Habitat for Humanity, and then there's a small number of market rate homes uh, that Sterling Homes is putting together. So we've taken that money and we are, we're, we're uh, performing all the initial studies for this potential project. We have a report we need to submit at the end of summer. We received uh, what the DOE is referring to as phase one funding. We're gonna try to get phase two funding where money can actually be utilized toward the project. But the interesting thing, well, there are lots of interesting things about this DOE grant, um, but a couple of the interesting things is two of our deliverables one is we have to be able to report out on the workforce needs in the state for community geothermal to be a, like a, a viable path forward. Um, so we are we have a, a fellow who was hired through this grant money who is doing who's doing some reporting on that now. What workforce is needed? What skills currently exist within the current HVAC industry in the state that can be transferred uh, to to geothermal? Uh, and we're also looking at our own employees. So right now, this fellow is looking at all of the job descriptions of, uh, of the individuals, the roles that would need to be played for a community geothermal project and comparing it against the job descriptions for all of our construction and service technicians at the gas utility and looking for the knowledge, abilities and skills um, where there's overlap and seeing what sort of training or licensure would be needed so that, again, these people wouldn't necessarily transition their jobs, but they would be equipped to perform a wider array of, of jobs. So that's a piece of the work. And to that end, we're also engaging with all of the well drillers working in the state, asking them about their experiences with geothermal, um, what they're seeing for demand, where their constraints are when it comes to workforce development, if the demand within the industry were to grow. Um, the other component of the grant, our other deliverable, is community engagement. So they wanna see community buy-in on these projects. And to that end, we've been meeting with various you know, town planners for et cetera, et cetera, like in Hinesburg, we've been meeting with the Chittenden County Regional Planning Committee. We've been meeting of course with um, environmental groups and weighing all of their feedback and incorporating it into the report we're gonna to deliver to the Department of Energy, letting them know what concerns the, we, you know, anybody looking to move a geothermal project forward would need to address within a community. We have a nice clear path forward. We've got, there are 11 of these projects nationally. They're primarily focused on retrofits. So their community engagement is a bit of a different animal. Lots of door to door, getting, educating people, bringing them up to speed. Ours is more engaging with developers and planners to make sure that we're all in agreement on what an accessible and cost-effective um, system would look like for you know, new homeowners and, and renters. So that's the DOE grant component. Lastly, I wanna talk about some other work that VGS has done just to give you a little flavor for what's taking place nationally. So in um, December of 2022, myself and uh, a peer who works for Northwest Natural, a small gas utility out in Portland, Oregon, 
realized that we were looking to learn the same things when it came to what community scale geothermal could look like for a gas utility. And we thought there had to be, you know, a few others like us. So in December, 2022, we started a group. We engaged with 10 gas utilities nationally uh, who are all in various stages of exploring what community geothermal could look like um, for a gas utility. Our thinking at the time was, you know, we're gonna make mistakes. Let's just have one of us make the mistake and the other ones can learn from it. And, you know, we can come back to our offices and our communities looking smarter. If we have a grand success, we can, the others can replicate it. Let's um, put together a group that, that focuses primarily on information sharing and access to industry experts so we can go further faster. So since December, 2022, that group has grown. It's now 24 gas utilities nationally um, with Department of Energy involvement and a lot of other folks who pop in and offer their expertise. And um, the 24 gas utilities who are members of this group represent the gas utilities serving about half of, of the natural gas users in the country. So it's become a big group and we meet quarterly and we engage a lot in between because we want to learn what's happening on the regulatory side of things in different states. What's policy looking like? Uh, what are customers saying? You know, we want to be able to learn from one another um, and replicate the successes where we can. And then, of course, also bringing in geothermal experts to talk to us about identifying the best projects. So our involvement in that group, I think, it speaks to VGS is committed to pursuing this, obviously, but we're really committed to learning from every available resource because we want to do an exceptional job of providing this service to our customers. Uh, and I think that's all I've got to share. Yeah. And if, if you look at the testimony we submitted, the backside of it is just a list of the things that we've done. And they include the trainings that we've done, the site visits. We've gone down to a couple communities in Massachusetts that have done this work. I mean, we are putting significant resources into understanding the possibility here because we think it's going to be good for our communities, for our customers, and for the state. There's all sorts of benefits. And of course, our workforce, again, transferable skills. We have one of the largest thermal workforces in the state. We have folks who work with customers every day. Um, bringing these systems to market is going to take uh, talking with those customers, educating them, and making the value proposition known. It's a huge value proposition. So we hope our customers can realize the benefit. Thanks. Um, so thanks for that overview. I have to say, um, you mentioned electric boiler. Uh, so that makes me a little nervous unless it's combined with like, um, you know, demand response or some sort of real time monitoring. Yep. Unless you have some amazing new technology that would make that. Sure, we haven't efficient. identified yeah. any miracles. Okay. All of the electric boiler projects that we're looking at, and again, this is completely removed from, not completely removed, but this is part of a portfolio of decarbonization services, no overlap with geothermal. Um, we are looking at it has to be a collaboration between the customer, VGS, and obviously another their electric utility provider because the demand response component is key. If it's going to benefit the customer, if it's going to benefit the electric utility, those all those boxes have to be checked in order for it to be a potential project. And there there is an example at JP. There were some headlines in the fall. Uh, they switched on a electric boiler which sits on next to its propane unit. This is how they heat their water park and other things. Um, that project has served as a model. And um, I won't get into the details, but certainly our colleagues at uh, Vermont Electric Co-op worked on that. It's a great collaboration with Efficiency Vermont and others who uh, added incentives to make it work. But that does look at monitoring grid, and doing demand response. Um, so it's a great project to look into if you're interested. I mean, because it can be used as a form of storage, which can be very, very helpful, well, we need all but the only if it's managed well. So mm -hmm. thank you. Sorry for digressing from geothermal. Thank you, Matt. Presentation. Just wondering, does Vermont Gas have any future plans of expanding down in the southern part of the state at all? Or? Well, what I will say is that, uh, you know, there was an expansion project some years ago now. Right. Uh, we're really excited to serve communities that we already serve. There's lots of infill opportunities. Um, but I do not think it's like okay. with a natural gas line Correct. with other services, right. well, it's anybody's so, gas. So we'll see. You know, it's certainly uh, we're in a really interesting point in Vermont energy policy. And certainly there's a whole new proposal with the Affordable Heat Act that would develop a performance standard for the thermal sector. 
So we're really focused on that. And we think there's a lot of opportunities within the compliance pathways to achieve compliance and focus on cost-effective solutions for our customers. All right, thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you, thanks Thank for you. having us. Appreciate it. Good to see you, and nice to meet you all. Well, and our next witnesses are just hovering and they looked in and now they're sitting down. Would you mind just letting them know that? Yeah, you can. Dylan. Dylan was Chef's staff person, but he was. Ben was in the body. Yes. All right. Um, are you are you uh, in the order you'd like to be, which is Mason, Overstreet, and then Julie, and then Ashley? Yes. Sure. So, Julie, Julie and I would actually love to testify together. Sure. That'll okay. expedite things. Take me a few minutes to bring up the presentation. She's pulling it up. Sorry. I'll do quick introductions while you're pulling it up. Okay. We can do quick introductions while we're pulling it up if that's okay. Uh, Shall I? Yeah, so we are going to shift gears and look at S213 um, and Final section of that includes a topic of yeah, echo. I think that's on. I think that may be on your computer. The echo. So yeah. You just if you just totally. hit no volume or minimize your volume. Yeah, I, I had it muted. Then turn the volume. Yeah, there you go. Again, shift gears to S two thirteen, and the final section of it is actually on polystyrene doc foam. And welcome our witnesses from, oh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Go ahead. Thank you, Joe, Chair Sheldon, members of the committee. Um, my name is Mason Overstreet. I'm a staff attorney with the Conservation Law Foundation. Hi, good morning. I'm Julie Silverman, the Lake Champlain Lake with the Conservation Law Foundation. Take a minute to bring up the presentation. While Julie is pulling this up, I was gonna say first, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and specifically about S213 and this polystyrene section. Um, you know, this S213 in particular is something that our organization has been working closely with a variety of partners on. And, and uh, we've been actively involved both on the river corridor section, the wetland section, dam safety. Um, in addition to this one, today we'll be talking about polystyrene, but we look forward to the conversation this afternoon too. Um, all right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Really appreciate it. So I'm um, really happy to be here <laughs> and thank you for taking the time to talk to us today um, about uh, the polystyrene part of S213. And uh, just a little bit of background. Um, the Plastic foam flotation is a huge problem and it's only been getting worse through all of the flooding and climate change issues that we've been faced with 
I've been working on Lake Champlain for nearly 30 years in a lot of different capacities. In fact, I worked for the Agency of Natural Resources in the Aquatic Invasive Species Program for quite a while. And, and I've seen firsthand all of the dramatic wind events, the wave increased wave, um, the dramatic water fluctuation, obviously with the flooding. And in fact, driftwood and ice are also a huge issue for what we see polystyrene coming into our waterways all across uh, Vermont, not just on Lake Champlain. So just to check in on that, um, this is, these are pictures from the July flood. I know that you've been hearing a great deal of testimony about flooding and why this is so important to include this issue in the uh, climate, um, the Flood Safety Act. Um, you can see in the middle picture that we have a lot of debris that's been coming in. We oftentimes call this marine debris, even if it isn't a freshwater ecosystem like Lake Champlain or the Connecticut River. Um, and you can see this is the Winooski Valley, uh, the Winooski River coming in at Hydro One, just completely flooding that floodplain. And there's a volunteer in this picture actually picking up a baby car seat. Thank goodness there was actually nobody in it. But when I first came upon it, that was a fear that I had. It was a uh, heart sinking. I've been picking up people's lives um, almost every day um, in Lake Champlain because of the horrible flood impact and people's lives being washed down rivers and into our lakes, rivers, and ponds. And part of that you can see in these images here, this is what happens. And I'm going to pass some of these around. Please feel free to um, hang on to these and refer to them through the presentation. I've got a bunch of it here. Um, what you're seeing in these pictures, exactly what you're seeing in those containers, that is expanded polystyrene, the same kind of material. It's a plastic, it's a polymer from fossil fuels that breaks up. It's similar to the kinds of material that was banned um, in Act 69 with food container, food products. Um, and this is what it looks like on Lake Champlain or in marinas when it ends up in our bodies of water and it harms wildlife. You can see in these images, it has been found researchers both in Vermont and New York um, have found uh, floating foam, this plastic foam material in every part of the food web. Um, you can see the bird picking up the little pieces. Um, it's also the same kind of stuff if you've ever been in a beanbag chair, that's the same kind of stuff that Phil is in there and it's in every part of our food web. It's also destroying our shorelands, our wetland environments. We know how important wetlands are. Um, they are a sponge, we know that, and they are filtration systems for our water that comes in. And here we are putting a foam <laughs> in the flotation of docks directly in harm's way. This stuff is fragile. Um, and I'm gonna give you this piece. It's gonna stay in a plastic bag, you could pass it around. Um, because it is so fragile, it would be breaking up. I don't want it in your coffee. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want you eating it, uh, but it is toxic. Um, and then here are some pictures also. This is the typical stuff on the shores that I have picked up on our beaches. Uh, it has a huge impact on recreation as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's an aesthetic issue. It's an environmental impact issue. It's a, a wildlife issue. And uh, yep. Yeah. You can finish your thoughts. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and it's something that we've just seen continue uh, more and more and more. And we know that our shores and our lakes and our rivers and our ponds are becoming more and more important to people as they are cooling off. We know that with climate change and the increase in temperatures. And we see the populations. This is a typical beach. This is Letty Beach in the Burlington area. And this is typically what it looks like now um, with all of the increase in temperatures. Sorry, that was my thought. Representative <laughs> Smith. Thank you. The, some of the things that pass around are probably from docks. The majority of all of that foam is from docks, yes, from yes. flotation and docks that have broken off of the dock itself. And I think, and you can correct me, uh, that they have, there's a bill now, or there was a bill passed that encloses foam like that in, in, in a hard plastic. For docks. So that's actually what we're here to talk about today is that there is no current legislation on the books. We talked about this. Well, we may have, but let's um, finish hearing the testimony. Oh, I, I, yes, I agree. But I'm just, we did a couple of weeks ago, we, we had discussed. Well, it, 
We did the walk through the bill and it's in the bill. Okay, good. That's, That's right. Yeah. So now we're taking testimony on that section good. of the bill. Good. Thank you. So I'll, I'm going to just show you these pictures to get to your point, which is this, these are pictures of uh, floats or floating docks, the wood structure on the top okay. where you would be walking. The pink stuff down below is what we're referring to. And Mason's going to do a, a walkthrough. I was talking about the problem of this foam in our environment. And Mason's going to talk about a little bit more about the legislation and how we're proposing solutions to the problem. And that blue stuff in the picture, it's kind of strange. It's in a metal cage. It's called a wave attenuator or like a sort of floating breakwater um, in marinas around. So those are two different applications. That's what it looks like when it's in the water at whole. What you were seeing is what it looks like broken up by the environment. Mm -hmm. so, Mason, if you want to talk a little So actually, if you just hold this picture, I'll, yep. I'll just say a few things and then we'll get into kind of the nuts and bolts of the bill. But to um, hopefully clarify your question, Representative, is in 2019, Representative Sullivan introduced a bill similar in nature to this, um, and that bill never passed. But it, it was an effort basically to do what the parts of this section in S2, S213 set forth, which is to require encapsulation or a protected covering around foam, you know? Um, and so that's what, what we can get into. Um, really quickly though, like in regards to just so we're good on terminology. So what you see in the photograph is a great example of unencapsulated polystyrene foam. So what we're talking about is basically styrofoam without a protective covering. What this, what this section of S213, and actually just for everyone's reference, I've got S213 as passed by the Senate and I'm looking at page 59, starting at line one, and I'll be referencing um, the first section of this subchapter is definitions, but I'll be starting on page 60 to actually talk about what this section of the bill sets forth. Um, so everyone's on the same page. But going back to terminology, we'll be the bill talks about unencapsulated polystyrene foam. It requires encapsulation, so encapsulated or protective covering over polystyrene, and then also and I'll reference this, but the bill prohibits um, encapsulated loose bead polystyrene. So that's like the loose, tiny styrofoam balls, which are encapsulated. But what happens is over time, sometimes the encapsulation breaks, the small polystyrene styrofoam balls spew out, and it's nearly impossible to clean up in the environment, it causes water quality issues, et cetera. Julie had a bunch of good photos on that. Um, so this is really good. I just, you know, when Mr. O'Grady did the first walkthrough of S213 with this committee, um, he did a nice summary of that. I'd like to reiterate some of it. But again, starting on page 60, um, you know, this section of the bill is pretty straightforward and relatively simple. And I think Julie made the connection. Some folks do ask, what's the connection between dock foam, climate change, and the Flood Safety Act? I think hopefully Julie made the connection. This is a climate change problem. Ashley Sullivan over here, who you'll hear from the Rosalia Project, has, has great documented data showing the exponential increase of basically this pollution in the environment, which can be linked to increased storm frequency. But let's talk about what the language in the bill sets out. First and importantly is the language in S213 in this particular section requires encapsulation, okay? So that's step one, um, is it requires encapsulation. And then secondly, at the same time, it prohibits unencapsulated polystyrene. So if we go back to one of the photos, um, it prohibits or bans basically polystyrene styrofoam without an encapsulation. It also simultaneously prohibits or bans encapsulated polystyrene with the loose beaded styrofoam balls, which is this. Um, now, really quickly, actually, on this point, and I'll get into this, some may ask, um, you know, what about some of the folks selling these materials? When this bill, um, you know, we fully recognize, oh, my gosh, how much this committee has in front of it. Um, and what's on your plate and that you can't hear from everyone. When this bill was before the Senate, the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee took testimony from one of the primary or largest dock installers in Vermont called Dock Doctors. And um, they all, so they do installation and sales. 
And the representative from Doc Doctors, I think importantly, one, went on record fully supporting this bill. Secondly, that representative said Vermont should have done this years ago. Like this, this should have, this step should have been taken two decades ago, but also and importantly, in relation to the loose cell beaded encapsulated polysyrene, the representative um, articulated basically that they're selling what this bill requires, which is the encapsulated polystyrene, um, if that makes sense. So again, going back to the terminology, we've got like the loose cell beaded, we've got the unencapsulated and the encapsulated, but the representative from Doc Doctors was like, we sell the encapsulate, what the bill is requiring. Um, okay, so moving forward. Um, Representative Smith. Thank you. Yes. Could you tell me what your thoughts are on uh, people that already have docs on lakes? Is this something that's going to be grant the your ideas to be grandfathered or it's a great question, Representative. And I would start with a few things. One is again going back to the different stakeholders. Um, Pat Swazi, the president of um, Vermont Federation of Lakes and Ponds, she testified in the Senate in the Senate. And the Federation of Lakes and Ponds in Vermont fully supports this bill and the language is drafted. In regards to folks who would be out of compliance, so to say, once you know this language were it to go into effect and this committee were to pass it, I think one of the interesting issues is um, if I and this is kind of like a circle uh, a circle to answer your question is that the Agency of Natural Resources went on record in the Senate about this section of the bill and they first said you know, in the realm of things that they're working on right now, this is not a high priority. They support the policy, but they said, we don't have the staffing, the resources, and the time to take this on and to implement it, but importantly, enforcement. So they said, we don't have the time to take on enforcement responsibilities. And so a compromise was struck. And part of the language in the bill, which I'll reference, is you'll see that basically there's language which allows a at a later date to develop and implement rules and promulgate rules to further carry out the subchapter. And so down the road, if a &R were to have the staffing and resources necessary to carry this out, there could be enforcement, you know, um, um, enforcement duties or responsibilities that a &R could take on. But I think in the near term, the bill bans unencapsulated foam, but there's no one who is going to go out and enforce you know, folks with non-compliant docs, if that answers your question. Sort of, yeah. Uh, that's a, sort of a great answer. Okay, now but, what? Uh, my next, uh, but uh, that, I'm good with that. But my next question is, are you at liberty to say who the representative from doc doctors were that you spoke with? Um, we can look at the Senate record. We can look at the Senate, the Senate. We can look at the Senate record because I'm embarrassingly, um, um, uh, have, uh, I am forgetting the person's name from Doc Doctors who spoke because I'm familiar with the person and the owner. I can check with it. Thank you. Um, I think one other important thing to your question, which actually relates to just summarizing what's in the bill and goes back to it, is, um, is one is um, on this issue of enforcement as kind of a compromise is you will see language in the bill that, that Mr. O'Grady spoke about, which establishes unencapsulated polystyrene as a nuisance under Vermont law. And so that's really a backstop to the enforcement provision. We don't feel that that would open the floodgates to litigation or anything, but it would allow for someone to, um, you know, it declares unencapsulated polystyrene as a nuisance under Vermont law. So, um, Going back a couple, because now that we're jumping around, um, a couple things also in the summary of what the language in the bill does is um, on the disposal issue. Lots of times, folks like Julie and Ashley who are in the field all the time, you'll see these kind of derelict, um, unencapsulated or irreparable docks. And oftentimes what happens is folks will just pull them up on shore, they're still close to the water, and they're still polluting the water. So there's language in the bill that requires proper disposal or encourages proper dispo disposal. And then on the point of doc doctors and actually folks selling um, and installing these materials is the bill importantly prohibits the sale and distribution 
of unencapsulated polystyrene and loose cell beaded polystyrene. Um, so I think I've covered, there, there's basically six points again that the language in the bill sets out. And I've covered those in non-consecutive order, but I'm happy to field any questions and we can jump back to the presentation. But if anyone has questions on kind of the nuts and bolts or interworkings, yes. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation. I just wondering, um, has there been any discussion of any alternative to people that want to put docs on or have docs already? Is there an alternative product they could use that's uh, you know, cost effective? There are many, and I can actually go through. I have a whole slide oh, of okay. alternatives, okay. which is great. Jump we can, there. No, that's okay. But it's a really, it's really important. Um, just really quickly, is Canada has been driving a lot of innovation because they have a lot of laws on the books that have already been on the books for a long time, and so the products are available. They've been available for decades, and if you want to see some of them, they're in Mallets Bay. They're at the Coast Guard station where the Dragon boats launch, and then I can show you a whole bunch of other great. alternatives. Thank you. Yep. Well, this is a thought that I'm having as I'm sitting here is if there are alternatives, I was going to ask the same question why are we allowing this at all? Well, because Great question. I know one of your one of the sections talks about the encapsulation has the last for 10 years. <laughs> My guess is people have docs, they don't do anything until they start to sink. Um, and so I'm sure you ended up having to compromise. I, I'm assuming you had to compromise a lot to get to where we are. But I'm sitting here thinking, why are we allowing this at all? Because if there are viable alternatives. So I'm sure we'll touch on that as you go through your slides. So. We, can, we can both touch on that. <laughs> um, I will say that I've been in contact with a lot of folks in Washington State, and they've actually had a law on the books about encapsulation. And they're also trying really hard to move forward with actually a full ban of all pyre polystyrene use. And again, it's increment, they're finding incremental steps or moving a process of educating consumers as well as educating manufacturers. And really it's a, it's a whole different way of thinking. And I agree with you. I personally, if I could wave my magic wand, would get rid of all expanded polystyrene in every application because nobody's proved to me one really salient use for it, period. But that's not my, that's my magic wand. Representative Bankers, I think I would I would follow up by saying you're exactly right. There was a compromise. There are organizations and advocacy groups on the spectrum that do not fully support what's in this bill because they agree. With you. And the solution is really air encapsulation. Now, the air encapsulated flotation materials are more expensive. And the majority from what we've learned, the majority of installers and companies that are manufacturing this are manufacturing the encapsulated polystyrene. So it's a huge step forward. It's not perfect. There are still problems with it. But again, I mean, it's an economics issue because the air encapsulation is slightly expensive. And again, we could debate that back and forth, but you're exactly right. And here's just a quick map of all the different municipalities, states, and other um, entities around the country that have already passed some kind of legislation um, from bans to encapsulation across the state, the country. So, so there are, I, I think here what's, what's good to know, there are state actions, there are municipal actions, um, there's a variety of different jurisdictions that have taken steps forward along the lines of what is in S213 as you see it. Um, and people often ask about New York, and there are actually two pieces of legislation um, right now in um, New York that are also going through the very similar process. So being somebody that's on Lake Champlain, um, doing all, most of my work, this would be a complete win-win for both Vermont, New York, and the waters that we share in between, which is Lake Champlain, if we could pass both Vermont and New York. And back to the whole alternatives, it makes economic sense as well, not to get into um, crunching the numbers too deeply, but over time, 30 to 50 years, it, you end up spending a lot more money if you don't encapsulate it and a lot more time to repair and replace that work. And again, just I mentioned, um, as you all know, you worked really hard on Act 69, you've already banned polystyrene in a lot of other applications. This is one of those applications um, that we feel that we can do a lot better at. And just again, you know, as Mason said, Doc Doctors has already said that that's what the work that they do. 
Um, that's an air float, just so that you see, it basically can take up the exact same footprint as a polystyrene float does. Um, it's just a matter of how many more manufacturers are out there doing the work and getting it out there. And again, as you know, supply and demand, it will drop the price the more manufacturing people get into the game and stop filling them with um, loose bead polystyrene. The price will become comparable if it's not already. And again, this is just some of the options, everything from the cheapest thing is an old barrel to floats to that beige unit on the bottom of that picture is the ones that you would see down at the Coast Guard station. And um, the new marina in Mallets Bay is also exclusively put in these air floats and they're happening and they're out there. And I can give you a list of probably four or five other manufacturers that are doing the same kind of work. And as I mentioned, we're not the only ones doing this. This is in full support, as Mason said, of the Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds. Um, the Connecticut River Conservancy has been doing actively doing this work on replacing um, dock foam flotation with encapsulated flotation for almost a decade. And there are a lot of people out there that think that this should have already happened. Um, so we really want to thank you for your time on this and consideration. And we feel it's a really, really important part of um, passing S213. I think if I can just add one final point on the supporters is, um, is this really is a win-win. It's a step forward. Representative Bongarts, as you said, it's not perfect, but it's a significant step forward. There is a climate connection. Um, that's the reason why it's in the Flood Safety Act. But as far as supporters goes, you know, this, the agency has supported the policy. Again, the agency has articulated it's not necessarily a priority, but they have supported the policy. The industry supports the language as drafted in the bill, which we feel is a good compromise. And then of course it has the support of advocates. Um, so thank you so much again for, for your attention and interest in all of your hard work on S213. Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Ashley Sullivan. Good Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak with you all today. Uh, my name is Ashley Sullivan, and I'm the executive director of a Vermont local nonprofit called the Rosalia Project. Um, we are an organization that is working on the problem of marine debris. Um, we've been around since 2012, um, doing cleanups all throughout the state. And what I'd like to share with you today is some data um, that we have been one of the cornerstones of kind of understanding the marine debris problem is um, is collecting the data, right? Like what are we finding and how does that drive solutions? Um, as as uh, Chris and Julie mentioned about Act 69, you know, we have seen in our data from before that legislation took place in July of 2020 to now a reduction in things that were banned. Um, reductions in plastic bags um, and, and really in the Burlington region, which is kind of one of our most popular cleanup areas, um, we have been finding no more straws, no more, you know, foam cups, uh, plates, clamshells, things of that nature. So these, this type of legislation really does um, have an impact in removing, removing this stuff from the environment. So, um, as I mentioned, we've been working on recovering and collecting debris in this in Vermont um, since 2012. And I'm here today to share kind of what we've documented, um, you know, uh, regarding unencapsulated polystyrene, which we're referring to as, as dock foam here, here today. So from, from 2012 to 2023, we have participated um, and, and led uh, 556 cleanups throughout Vermont, targeting 17 different geographic locations and a variety of watersheds from Lake Champlain, Otter Creek, uh, the White River, the Moyle River, um, and also the Winooski. And um, 
from all of these locations, we have removed over 87,000 pieces of foam. And these pieces range in sizes from, you know, four, you know, four feet by two feet, like that big hunk of plastic that, you know, foam dock that Julie was showing you earlier to the tiniest of little beads, like uh, the, the tiny, small, the, the fill that is, you know, can be as small as a, as a grain of rice. This uh, photograph um, is from the Burlington Harbor from November uh, 2022. And it shows, you know, as, as Julie was mentioning, that even modern constructed docks can fail in, in weather events. So this was an, an old wave attenuator from a, a local marina that broke apart and has now just been sitting in the water uh, uh, in the Coast Guard station, Coast Guard station there. And so here we kind of get into the data. So we have cataloged over 150 items from bottle caps to food wrappers and foam is the number two item. Um, closely, uh, the close lead is microplastics, which is, um, which is really not, not that surprising. Um, of the 87,000 pieces of foam that we've recovered, uh, just going to jump into some of the smaller ones. You can see that 36,000 pieces were large foam, which is defined as larger than 30 millimeters, so bigger than the size of a quarter. Uh, 14,000 of those pieces are small foam, which is defined as between three, and, I'm sorry, five and 30 millimeters, and 36,000 of pieces of micro foam. Um, which is smaller than five millimeters. So if you think of like your pinky finger and kind of like cut your nail in half, you know, that's that's about the size of a, of a five millimeter. So this is really, really tiny stuff. Um, this shows the breakdown of microplastics and microfoam throughout the years from 2012 to 2023. And what you can see is that the, the microfoam represents the orange and you can see that it is trending in the wrong direction. We are actually seeing more of this stuff. Um, the rate of accumulation is increasing um, and it's a possible result of the changing climate and the, the flooding that we have having. With every flood, the problem of foam and other debris is exacerbated. Um, and I think this is really evident in the documentation of post flood from Hurricane Irene, as well as the July floods that both we have sh we have shown and that the conservation law has shown. Um, the unpredictable and extreme weather we have experienced since we have begun collecting data, it's clear that the, that the problem is getting worse um, and not better. Um, as uh, I, I live in Burlington, Vermont, near Letty Park, um, which is on the shores of Lake Champlain. And on any given day, I can go down to that beach without fail and find this foam. So it's just there. And once it's in the environment, you know, as you can see, it is so tiny that it's nearly impossible to pick up. The good news is that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and you all can make a difference too. I strongly, our organization strongly supports S21, uh, S213, the Flood Safety Act and subchapter 2B um, and including these expanded polystyrene foam provisions. Uh, this is a long-standing issue um, that really should have be been addressed a while, you know, a long time ago. And I think that this legislation can do just, just that. So I, uh, I strongly encourage you to support this. Um, I think many commercial dock owners, as we've heard with dock, dock doctors in our state, have already begun to change out to more robust and environmentally friendly options. Uh, but it's just not happening fast enough. And I think that this legislation could really uh, make some movement on this action. So... Thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you. Do members have questions? Um, can you, could you just tell us a little bit more about your organization? I've just looked it up. Is it national or international? It's yeah, so we, um, it was founded here in Vermont in, uh, in 2000, actually in 2010. But when we look at marine debris, right, it affects all watersheds and ultimately um, impacts our ocean. So we operate May through October on a 60 foot sailing research vessel in the Gulf of Maine. So we target uh, doing cleanups, um, education programs, outreach, and also science research. 
most of our science research has been focused around microfiber pollution and microplastics. Um, but we also work in consumer debris space. So things um, that we find kind of more here in Burlington in the Gulf of Maine uh, because of the thriving lobster industry. We have a very big derelict gear. Um, so fishing gear uh, challenge and um, we work with heavy, heavy removal there as well. So yeah, we've worked, we've worked all over. Our founder is a National Geographic Explorer, lives in Granville um, and, uh, you know, travels the world. You know, she's working with the State Department, just came back from Scotland, you know, uh, informing communities uh, about the marine debris issue and impact that it's having on the environment and on human health. Thanks. I do want to mention one thing, um, you know, we're talking about um, kind of what are other, you know, the organizations that do support this bill. And right now, um, uh, Rosalia Project in partnership with the Lake Champlain, not Lake Champlain, sorry, the UVM Sea Grant Program, um, also SUNY Plattsburgh, Lake Champlain Committee, Conservation Law Foundation, we have just put in some funding uh, over funding request from NOAA to form the first of its kind marine debris coalition in Lake Champlain um, that also works with the state of New York as well, the Lake George Lake Keeper, as well as SUNY Plattsburgh. And the target is, is a foam education outreach and awareness campaign. And I think that funding, fingers crossed that we get it, but will really dovetail nicely as a tool to educate communities um, and various stakeholders um, in the marina industry about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the environmental impacts of, of polystyrene. So. All right, two members of Representative Fongart. Maybe should have asked this question earlier, so whoever, yeah adheres to um so you showed at one point I'm, I'm sorry i'm doing this but back in the cls slides um the, you know, the effects of flooding and all the debris that washes in from flooding um just in terms of kind of like the totality of the mess um how much of it comes from where i, I mean we're talking we're, we seem to be focusing on docks in this one form of Google balls and styrofoam, but and I, I mix, I get it. But there's also, it, it, I'm, I'm also wondering, is that actually a small portion of the total? And why, if, not that I, I'm not just wondering, why are we focusing on that as opposed to a bigger picture? Do you mean regarding? Not That's not a negative question. I'm just curious. Yeah, regarding the material phone? Together. Well, or just in general? Right? Ashley, <laughs> what, I, what, what I would say is Ashley's organization has the best data, again, which she's like sh shown on the slide. But to answer your question, our understanding, and Ashley can, can verify this, is one of the most significant contributors is DACA. You know, and so that's why this bill goes at it. Does it get at all the problem? Absolutely not. It's a statewide problem. There are other sources of foam, but this is one of the most major sources. So, but, but please. Yeah. Um, Again, I would say that, you know, back to Act 69, you know, when that bill was introduced and came into effect, you know, we have really seen a reduction in foam as it relates to food packaging, right? Um, if you look at the data from the Burlington area, like Burlington proper per se, you know, Dock foam is super high on the list, but so are food wrappers, right? Food wrappers is a huge. So there are, there's a lot of other low hanging fruit like uh, shotgun shells. That's another one that end up in the water a lot um, during duck season and end up washing on our shoreline. So, um, but I think as it relates to, to, to polystyrene, what we are seeing in the natural environment is coming from docks. So actually, it's true. Yeah. It, it, it's true that a major source of the foam that you're seeing and documenting is coming from dogs. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Just since you're here, we're just having a discussion, um, thinking about. I I understand what you're saying, and that all makes sense. Um, what is the strategy? I realize this is the topic of the bill directly, but just since you're here, what is the strategy for all the other debris? And there are other ways to cut down on that and to other than clean up other ways that you're thinking about that could long term be thinking about that up 
touch down on that as well. <laughs> Well, <laughs> Julie was talking about the magic wand yeah. and, you know, and I think that, you know, <clears throat> making things have value, right, is a huge <clears throat> part of that. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, there are, there's education, you know, educating people, you know, uh, public awareness campaigns can be a huge strategy too, um, you know, and, and innovation and redesigning. Uh, and reuse. And I'll just take a minute to add yeah. to that too. It's the work that happens is that we all, again, with flooding, the more development that's in the area of the floodplain and in the river corridor is going to be broken up and transported, right? So it's not just soil that mm. gets eroded. It's literally shipping containers and the tires and the siding of your home and that baby carriage and the gas, like it all is, if it's in the floodplain and if it's in the river corridor and it is impacted by water, it will be transported down into, the, into Lake Champlain or into any other body of water, part of that. Representative Vongarts, if I could, if this answers your question, um, this committee knows well kind of the half loaf of bread analogy, you know, and language in the original bill actually included other issue, other sources, you know, one of them. So worm cans are very common. Like I spent a lot of time in my own personal life doing a lot of fishing and I, worm cans are everywhere all over the state, you know, and they're the styrofoam ones. And so the bill originally had language for worm cans, but we knew that that would be an uphill battle and probably unrealistic to tackle just given how much the legislature has on its plate right now, including this committee and other committees. And so again, it came down to a compromise. Would we like to go after some of those other sources down the road? Absolutely. Um, and I, I mean, personally, I don't see this as piecemeal because again, we see this as being one of the larger sources of the problem, you know, but it's not, it's by no means completely perfect. I wasn't being critical, I just wanted to be thinking ahead at the same time we're thinking about. Larger response. extended producer responsibility legislation that mm. we have contemplated in the past, which could address packaging, but it could also address issues brought up yesterday in the toxins bill. Mm. Um, needs to be front and center of our minds as we are overwhelmed by a disposable economy. Yeah. Yes, I would say. Thank you for your testimony and your care um, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Members, we are scheduled to reconvene at one o'clock this afternoon to talk about S305 and S213 for committee discussion. So we'll see you all back here at one.